Welcome to Basement Tales with Sam Jackman, Charlie Einsman, Ed Grass, and Sandra Delancey. We have fun telling crazy but true stories about turning the worst possible property disasters into bags of money. Along the way, we'll pass along some important lessons to help you make cash on real estate. Sam and Charlie walked away from cubicle hell 25 years ago. Starting with no property, they created their own clear sky group of companies, sold hundreds of houses, bought dozens of rentals, and made millions in hard money loans. I'm Ed, a big firm litigator, until muscular dystrophy made me find a hobby other than suing people. I miss it. Sandra's the normal person here with a real job plus some rentals. Her decades of friendship with the group from office flunkies to property gurus might help keep us all humble and focused on learning something. I wouldn't count on it. Well, so far today we've decided selling baby names and selling kidneys is not going to make us money. So we're, our third option is basement tales. Not to be confused with basement tale, which is tail in the basement. <laughs> Don't go to that website. A lot of cameras. <laughs> a lot of cameras. I had a call with Charlie earlier in the week to work on the book. At, at least the first 10 minutes was, was entirely his alarm system beeping. Oh, know, that's the loud, funny part. As loud as it could possibly beep. This is my funny story. All right. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, so the last couple of days, uh, our, our alarm kept going off. Fire, fire, fire. You know, it <laughs> beat on the whole house because all three levels are connected. So they directed Angel downstairs to my basement, of course. And Angel undid one of the smoke detectors and out came a pile of ants on Angel. Oh. So we had we had a nest of ants inside in our smoke detector that was causing the alarm to go off. Well, there's a there's a real estate question. I'm going to be the one who keeps bringing everything back to like making money. So, you guys, what do what do you use for alarm systems at houses you flip? Do you bother? Do you? So we use Simply Safe, is what it's it's called, uh, and, and most of our properties it has a. Sometimes we add a camera to it if it's in a uh, particularly crime ridden spot here's where then, we can get a sponsorship from simply safe <laughs> how uh, do you do you get calls in the middle of the night so sam gets all the rental calls but we've had plenty it's prevented a couple of uh, thefts uh well, people will target you know vacant house without any question you know especially if it's got its appliances in there we put a property up for rent <laughs> and i must have gotten a hundred calls in a day pretty recently <laughs> <laughs> and we did in Fred Fredericksburg. That was pretty rough. Well, there that that brings us to our actual topic today, which is what's the market like for rentals and right now, and what's it going to be like? What's what's the what's maybe you can say the rental market because well, should I buy a rental property now? Should I wait? I've got some money. I should. What's going on, Sammy? Why don't you start? It's a great time to have a rental property because there are hardly any properties that are for rent right now. If you have one available, there you just get inundated with high quality calls. Yeah, I just, uh, this shows you how much I know. I was originally thinking, you know, you weren't gonna be, people wouldn't have money, you wouldn't be able to rent stuff. But I guess what's happened that I've been reading about and I've seen is the normal, and maybe Charlie, you know, you, I think you've talked about this, the normal process of properties and rentals turning over has stopped. There's, there's no inventory for somebody to move to a different rental and people are not getting, you know, courts are not removing people. So it's it's this whole mess, I guess. Is that, yeah, that what you're seeing, Charlie? Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, the normal number of evictions that would normally happen have come to a, a, a halt. Uh, and then you've got a ton of people looking to move into this area, quasi-military uh, folks, that are trying to come into this area that need need housing. And the problem is, is that because there's no availability in uh, uh, rental housing, uh, the rental prices are starting to go up. Is there an obligation though to um, to rent to service members? Good question. No, but we but we always do. Good. Yeah, in other words, in other words, right, in other words if we know they're in the military, that puts them uh, a step ahead of everybody else. Right, they have very stable income, I yeah, would think. They're very stable. Oh, yeah. And if they don't pay their rent, we make a call to the commanding officer 
let them deal with it, you'll get your rent paid. Uh, we put a house on the market that was beyond the top rent price in that subdevelopment. And we got four applications on it and Sam got a hundred calls. And so if you look across the board, uh, all inventory is down, uh, purchase inventory and rental inventory. And so a lot of people that are coming into this area are having, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't really know what they're doing. I guess they're going to, they're, they're, they're having to go into apartments, but even apartments are facing that kind of problem too, and that they can't evict tenants. And so what's happening is there's no new inventory on the market. And Sandra's Sandra's getting a new piece of real estate. I was going to say, so I expect a, uh, ni nicely unlicensed in DC. I bet I'll get a few phone calls too on that one. Mm -hmm. What is that? Uh, I, we're going to put it on the market for you as a courtesy. Yeah. And uh, I'll try to put your name on so they can just call you directly. <laughs> But they always call a listing agent. They just uh, I, I'm definitely a little concerned. So so this is a good conversation to have. A little concerned about what you are know, you concerned having, about having an investment property right now that I need to rent. Oh no. Um, I, I'm a little concerned. You know that I'll I'll get a renter. You know, and that you know. The and what? Quality of the renter. Oh, they're going to be that. great. Then no one can find a place to rent. Oh you're no, you're in the you're in the driver's seat. Yeah, yeah. you're going to have a great. Time. You are in the driver's seat. So what you got to do is, it's number one is the source of income. As long as you like the source of income, and then it's the amount of income, then it's the credit. Or you could just go source of income, credit, and then oh, the amount of I have income. to do a little disclosure in DC as a licensed broker. I can tell you, you can't discriminate based on source of income. You can't? You cannot in the district. And I think it's newly enacted law in Virginia as well under our new fantastic uh, administration. So, but in DC, no. like if, someone, if someone comes to you and says, hey, I have income from, Section 8 housing or whatever, it's housing assistance to treat them exactly the same as, a, as any other, as a, the, the person who's working at, at the Treasury Department. Well, but is clearly, it specifically that though? I mean, a, a Section 8 versus, you know, a traditional job, but, you know, let's say I just don't want to rent to someone who works in some uh, industry. No, no, the same it, thing? It, no, it's as I say, as far as I know, in my broker experience, it's source of income. You can't discriminate, it's not a non-discriminatory factor. Okay. So, so if a person manages a car wash and the other person works at the newly expanded Amazon, which yeah. I could see people not wanting either one, depending on their predilections, <laughs> but, but yeah. basically that, and then versus section eight or whatever you, yeah, you, you can't yeah. go into. No, you have to just go on, on, on credit and uh, income level. That's, that's the criteria. Interesting. And, and yeah. also, you know, references, you can, you can use references still, right? If they can't, if they can't establish two references from uh, prior tenancy or, or demonstrate that they've made on-time payments on their mortgage or something, you can certainly. But like a, a, a brand new job versus, I mean, I've only been working for less than two years versus I've been working for 10 no, years. No, no. Not I that mean, either. No, no, no. Now you as an individual, just you renting to an individual without a real estate broker, may be governed in ways that are somewhat different. But as far as a real estate broker transaction, that's, that's for sure. Well, it's, it's interesting some of the pitfalls you can have. For example, I, for other stuff I did as a lawyer, DC has a very broad anti-discrimination statute and you cannot discriminate based on party affiliation. So if literally, if you find out somebody's like in say a new administration and, and this is maybe a lot of turnover right if the administration changes sure uh, it can be a lot of that somebody comes in and says hey i work for the biden administration and somebody else applies and they're a trump supporter you you cannot um say send them an email and say hey so and so supporter <laughs> we don't rent to people like you L literally that's a violation in yeah, dc sure. and, not, and not and not just in in housing it's a general anti-discrimination and it's very unusual it's it even affects ethical obligations for lawyers and all that can't... stuff in dc has penalties like yeah well, imagine DC has, has a penalty for everything Anytime yeah. you say people like you, that's always a red flag, right? You never <laughs> say people like you. That's the first thing. So people oh. like you with, you know, you know, two legs or people like you with a head, you know. Yeah, no, people, some people really do not like that. And, and I'd have to go back and look, but there's a lot of, I don't know if you call them protected classes, but there's oh, yeah. a lot of categories like that oh. beyond the traditional ones that, that obviously have been around since the sixties oh, yeah. or whatever. It's, it's added a lot. Of course, uh, 
in D.C., sexual orientation is in there, but not in other jurisdictions, and uh, it, it really varies. But yeah, I guess those are some landmines for the new renters. But so let's let's fast forward then. Right now, it's great to have rental properties. What's going to happen after the apocalypse the, if there's no new COVID relief bill? Do they start to allow people to be evicted? Not. Nah, this th- that's a great question. First of all, you've been calling the apocalypse since I've known you. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Like Fifteen years. But Char- Charlie had some interesting ideas about about evictions and uh, foreclosures coming on? Well, I think, uh, I think in the commercial sector is going to get beat up first. I think it's going to get blasted. It's going to get yeah. more than beat up. It's going to get exploded. Yeah, we're, we're going to see that first. Um, from a residential standpoint, uh, the thing that's going to get beat up is going to be apartment apartments, especially for all the entry level people. Um, most of our properties and, and most properties that are not considered entry level properties don't have, that don't have entry level rents, those properties are going to be okay because most of the people renting those properties are either <clears throat> government workers or either technology workers or they're, or they're in some sort of uh, stable job. The problem is, is in the entry level rental class, depending upon where you are, uh, those are the folks that are going to get the crap beat out of them. But the difference though is, is if you have entry-level properties, uh, most of the folks that are in entry-level properties that are landlords, a lot of them own them cash, outright cash. So I, I, I'm not so sure what you're actually going to see moving forward. It's, it's, it's hard to call because uh, you would have already seen it by now because we've, we've been in this thing since March. We're now into October. That's seven, what, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. That's eight months of rent payments. So I would think you would start to see some kind of breakdowns within those individual property owners. And we really haven't seen that because we are, we are, we are marketing to out of state, out of area property owners to go buy their houses and our marketing efforts are not working right now. So what that tells me is that these guys aren't really at a distress level. And so I'm not- well, they don't have to pay their mortgages. They're not obligated to pay them. They all have, um, you know, deferments, of, of payments. So the, the landlords aren't under any pressure. And I think in our region, I don't think they're under pressure anyhow, because we only have, we have the same rate of slow payments in our, on our property portfolio of more than 50 properties that we have always had. And there's been no change. Now we got a source of income change. A couple of people moved to subsidies, but we've still got on-time rents. So I think, I think a bigger thing is like when these foreclosures come to market. So there's going to be a time at which no matter who's in office, uh, banks are able to enforce their contracts. You know, they're going to eventually be able to collect and, and foreclose. Right, because most, most of the loan stuff has been deferments. You don't have to pay it now, but it just, it's adding up as what is happening. So if I owe 2000 on my mortgage, and I don't pay it for six months, I owe 12000 and I think you have to pay it right away as soon as the, as soon as the moratorium is lifted. Mm, yeah, let me, let me tell you about that. That's not Please the do. Because Please we, do. Did, we did take advantage of, you know, the deferment. So we were impacted by COVID, you know, I'm unemployed. So um, we, we took a deferment for three months um, on our loan, and it was added to the, you know, the, the principal. So on our, you know, mortgage statement, we see that amount that we deferred shows up every month. We weren't told that we have to, you know, pay it by, you know, three months or whenever the deferment ended, but we came out of, you know, the deferment and we started making, you know, monthly payments. But, you know, here's what happened is that we wanted to refinance our loan and in order for us to refinance the loan, the underwriters are saying that we have to pay that money back. So oh. we are going to now have to pay back that deferment amount uh, or have three months of consecutive, you know, payments before we can, you know, actually refinance the loan. So, so if you weren't to refinance the loan, what would be the circumstance? Would you just to, would it, uh, uh, extend the loan three months or how does that work? It would extend the loan three months. So at the end of the, you know, 28 years and six months, yeah. we, we would have to make an extra, you know, whatever that extra payment is. Yeah. Or it gets added to any payoff. So if we, you know, go to refi again, we would have to pay it. So 
I think that's pretty manageable for people. It is. Right. If it's put at the end like that, I thought some of the legal requirement is they have to defer it until the deferment period ends and then you owe it with interest. But probably Sandra, as a you know, high quality borrower with a with a good bank, presumably, they can choose to be do that, just add it to the principal and not charge you penalties or otherwise. So I would I bet a lot of the big lenders are are doing that. I mean they for for good borrowers, they don't want to go through that foreclosure mess again. Right. They probably don't even have to report them as as uh, delinquencies. No. Uh, and that that helps them when they go to their audit, right? Because if they have to report all their delinquency, their deferments as delinquencies, these guys would be freaking wiped out in a week. So from there, when does the when does the deferment end for everybody? Is there a date at which these deferments end? Well, hold on though. Uh, it, I think it's, it's going to depend on what administration gets into office. Right. I think if if Trump wins and stays, it's going to be over in January. But if the Democrats come in, I wouldn't be surprised if they move this thing from uh, January 1 until April 1 or maybe even July 1. So I think they're going to add another three to six months on it to give everybody more time to when they get into office. Because remember, they're not getting into office until January. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. I think it's going to be dependent upon who wins the election. I'm sure well, they but, don't want to look like the administration that came in and all of a sudden all of your, your mortgage payments are due now. Right. You know, since we came into office. It's probably not a good, yeah, that, good way to that's start. That's not a good look. You know, not a good look. You don't want to start that way. So, you're, well, so how, long, how long do you say, Charlie, if, if a new administration comes in, how long do you think it'll be before the deferments are up? Do you think they'll let just people not pay their mortgage until June? I think they'll add at least another three months. Well, what? let's say just hypothetically Biden wins and even win, and the Democrats win the Senate. So you would think, well, like Charlie says, I agree, they'd want to do that sort of deferment, but don't forget about the filibuster. So even with a minority in the Senate, the Republicans can block that. And, they, and that's why there's no CARES Act renewal right now. So because most of the Republicans don't want it to happen and Mitch McConnell doesn't want it to happen and for good or bad reasons, whatever it is, they, so just because Biden wins and the Democrats win the Senate doesn't mean they're going to be able to get an extension through. My expectation would be there's going to be political gridlock. I think you're right. If Trump wins and, and they keep the Senate, the Democrats would go along with whatever extension they're willing to do. And I, while we were talking, I just looked up for the federally backed mortgages, uh, the lender and servicer may not foreclose until December 31, 2020. And if you have financial hardship, you have a right to get forbearance for 180 days and get an extension of another 180 days. Whoa, so they've already got 180 plus 180? That's a whole year. For forbearance, correct. July 1. Well, that's There's a no forbearance. That means you don't have to make a payment till July 1 under the current law. Right, right. And this says there'll be no additional fees, penalties, or intra additional <laughs> interest for the forbearance. Oh, and then no additional fees? Mm -hmm. It's not a bad deal unless you want to refinance like I did, and then all of a sudden you have a year of you know mortgage payments that you have to make up or else you're stuck until which case you can make up those payments. Well, they'll probably want to keep you stuck because the refinance is probably at a lower rate. If they've got you, say, at a, a couple-year-old loan and it's 4 or 5%, that's gold. I mean, right now, new mortgages are going out at like 2.5% or less. So it's kind of it's interesting sort of trap they can keep you keep you. Yeah. Well, Sandra fell into a trap with a terrible loan officer. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were making up stuff, you know, they were making up things and, and hoops for me to jump through. Oh my gosh. So the foreclosures aren't going to be possibly even on the market till September of next year. On, based on that, that's, that requires a total of a business evaluation on, in terms of our flipping business as well as, as what, hard, what people are going to need hard money for, right? Because that, that's going to, and the, the, you're going to want to buy a lot of rentals. That's all I can figure out. You want a rental and you want it empty. You don't want it with a per occupant who could take till September <laughs> next year. And then out. you want to be in forbearance with the loan. Get the rental. And do, just yeah, you want a rental and you want to be in forbearance. You Forbear want. it for a year. <laughs> right. <laughs> Keep it empty. Cash flow city, you get five of those. You don't have to work. Yeah, but how are these banks going to stay in business? 
Well, they're not reporting them as def- they're not even having to report them as deficiencies. They just it's just forbearance. Yeah, they just got a loophole, man. They just keep uh, keep going. Are you are you wondering what happens to the cash flow? Because there's, yeah. no, yeah, there's no real cash. There's no cash. So they maybe they'll increase their borrowing limits, but they seem to be pretty constrained at the Fed window. I don't know. That's hard to understand. That's good. Well, that was, that was worthwhile. That was a good little, I like that. That was a good discussion. And are we doing this on video too, or just yes. on podcast? Huh? It's on video. Oh, you didn't know it was video. <laughs> right.